Welcome to the Fortified Project. I'm Tomasz Finta. Today my guest is uh, Jeff Wilson. Jeff is a vet, an adventurer, an entrepreneur. Uh, what else should we know about you, Jeff? That pretty much sums it up, Thomas. Um, I mean, my passion uh, has always been just getting outdoors in whatever way, shape or form. And also <laughs> animals. You can see from the house we're surrounded by animals. So uh, the balance has kept it really fresh for me. You know, I'm in my late 40s now and I still mentally feel like I'm 24. Right. So, um, it, but it's that passion for life. Uh, that I can see you want to pass on. It's what I want to pass on. Um, and, you know, as I travel around Australia particularly, um, there's an epidemic of men particularly dying emotionally at 40 and then waiting till 80 to get buried. And, you know, hmm. it's for me it's about um, pushing hard every day and, um, you know, standing for your tribe, for your family and uh, making sure that you spend yourself up. Right. You, know, you want to be buried at 80, having you know, known that every day you gave it your best. That's awesome. I like that, I like that last sentence. Um, now, I, I know that you weren't born in Australia. Uh, you were born in Africa. And, and even the first few years of your life uh, were rather adventurous. Can, can you tell us a bit about those years? What yeah, do you remember? My, my father was a veterinarian, as was his father and his father before him. So there's a whole line of veterinarians, but he was working in Uganda at the time. Um, <laughs> I was born at the early part of Idi Amin's reign in, in 1970. And over the next five years, uh, Uganda started to fall apart. And there was a river in front of our house, and this is probably before my memory, but my mother's description of it was that, you know, there'd be a body a week and then a body a day and then multiple bodies a day floating past the house. So oh. the barometer on how Uganda was going was, you know, measured by how many bodies were floating past the house. So um, when it got to a point where it was obvious the country was going to fall apart, um, they decided to, to buy a light aircraft and fly all the way uh, in a Cessna 175 to Townsville because the old man had picked up a job in Townsville in the veterinary research field. And uh, so I was five, my sister was seven, and we jammed into this tiny tin box. And if anyone's seen a, a Cessna 175, they're tiny. Mm -hmm. like they're, they're, the cockpit is probably from here to the wire long and, and not much wider. And um, to fly that for 42 days uh, with no support, it's just crazy. They had two times over the Saudi desert with the engine um, they developed a, a, a ball of sand in the fuel tank for some reason and the engine cut out twice. The plane fell for thousands of feet and then the ball rolled away and the engine restarted again. And they had all sorts of dramas, but um, that was kind of my first adventure and I think it kind of set the tone you know, for the rest of my life. I've, I've, we kind of have an adventure year and then a non-adventure year so the family can recover. Right. And uh, <laughs> we're in the middle of an adventure year now, I head off to Antarctica in nine weeks um, to do probably the most brutal, brutal campaign of my adventure career, which is an attempt to break the longest solo polar record. So it's a journey of nearly 6,000 kilometers right. um, across Antarctica. And uh, it's required some pretty um, tough training, which we've, you know, we're very lucky here on the hill. So that, that hill's been an integral part of the training and just, just mentally getting prepared for, you know, long days uh, down there. My traveling style is, is up to 16 hours traveling a day and then a bit of recovery and then do it again. And that goes on for day after day after day. So the mental side of solo polar travel is probably bigger than the physical side. Mm. Um, but just getting, you know, I think the other thing about these journeys is getting uh, men particularly to understand that uh, discomfort is not a bad thing. Like, yes. um, you need a little bit of discomfort in your life to keep you fresh and keep you strong. Um, and you know, the whole world's way of everything becoming soft uh, is not working. You know, people elect uh, for comfort over discomfort every time. And um, it's a bit like integrity is having the bravery to do something that you know might be uncomfortable, but it's the right thing to do. Um, the fitness side of things, 
the fitness side of things is similar. You know, it, it's putting your body uh, under duress so that um, you can perform at your best at all times mm. is, is really important. Definitely. You, know, you can't, um, and I think getting that across, I, I don't ever want people to look at what I do and go, well, if I'm not matching that standard, I'm not succeeding. Mm -hmm. I, I really want them to go, they don't have to do a solo trip across Antarctica. Their adventure could be something a lot simpler, a lot, you know, uh, lower key, but as long as they're getting off the sofa, that's all I'm interested in. Yes, and that is one of the um, uh, the purposes or my my goal uh, is to inspire people and uh, these adventures, living and training for adventure can be something that you can look forward to uh, before you even go. It's exciting before you go, it's exciting when you're doing it, it's exciting after. So definitely the way to go. And uh, I know you had um, uh, another adventure after finishing your studies uh, involving bicycles. What was that about? Yeah, I had a, um, uh, a crazy dream originally was to fly an ultralight around the world at the age of 17. Mm. And uh, I just struggled to get any corporate sponsorship because I think at the age of 17, um, no one really took it seriously. Mm -hmm. um, so in the end, it was a lot cheaper to buy a bicycle and I, I cycled from London all the way down through Europe and then across um, sort of Greece and then down into Egypt. And the idea was to get back to Kenya, mm -hmm. you know, where I was born uh, or Uganda um, by bicycle. And that, that three month journey was, was certainly a, uh, an introduction into, um, you know, long journeys using a simple vehicle, um, totally carbon free uh, you know, and, and so many adventures along the way. It was an amazing trip. Sounds like it. Jeff, I understand you also hold a few world records. Um, Want to talk about those? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're all sort of bizarre endurance <laughs> records. So um, we held the, the longest kite journey on land for years, but then a, a good friend of mine just broke our record in China of all places, Mongolia, China. So, uh, but the first person to cross the Sahara Desert using wind power alone, and then um, we were the first team across from Australia to Papua New Guinea kite surfing. Um, and then so far, the longest solo polar journey by an Australian. And uh, the interesting one is, I did a journey about four or five years ago for the McGrath Foundation, and we made a sled uh, out of Sarah's breasts. Like it was this crazy idea to make uh, a sled out of a woman's breasts and then drag that from one side of Antarctica <laughs> to the other <laughs> to raise funds for the McGrath Foundation. And the boob sled was kind of a bit of a laugh at the time, but that boob sled has, you know, gone all the way around the world and um, the records had nine men try and break it, the 53 days. So prior to that, it was held by one of my heroes, a Norwegian called Borg Usland, uh, or Berger Usland, I think they say it. I contacted him and said, listen, I want to break your record and I want you to train me. And he was humble enough to go, mm, yeah, you're a bit crazy, but yeah, sure. And I don't think he really felt any great threat from an Australian polar <laughs> yes. traveller. What do we know about the polar? <laughs> yeah, what do we know about it? Living on a Circum beach. And conditions. he really is the real deal. Like he's the real polar explorer from the north. And, uh, but he guided me and eventually I trained with people that he trusted. And, uh, you know, sometime later I, I finished that journey in 53 days and took 14 days off his record, which was just wow. crazy. Right, really. But since then, there's been nine men, better funded, stronger than me, probably mentally stronger than me, but because their reasons for being there weren't aligned with something that they really believed in, mm. um, they've got close, you know, within 24 hours of breaking it, but nobody's broken it yet. One guy died in the process, so mm. it's a brutal, it's a brutal place, but that record eventually will fall. You know, it, it amazes me every year that it doesn't get beaten. Um, but it's not the original journey that I wanted to do. The original journey I wanted to do was the longest solo. The longest. 
and that's the one we've finally got the permission for. Um, you know, it's going in entirely Russian territory, so we've avoided the Australian permission process to a degree. Um, and the exciting thing is, you know, November 5th, 6th, I'll step to the plate and, and, you know, be held accountable for what I've spoken out. Now, this is, this is such an such an interesting um, uh, adventure idea. I, I'm trying to grasp uh, what what would what it involves, what it entails. Like just thinking as a as a fitness guy, thinking nutrition. How how on earth are you gonna get through that journey? How much food can you carry on? And what is your food source for such journey? Yeah, it's really difficult because the the food uh, makes up half my weight. So I have about 180 kilo payload, and I just measured the food, I think it's 95 kilos. <laughs> so, um, and the problem with it is, if, if it's too high in fat, your bowel can't absorb it. Um, but if it's too low in fat, it's too heavy. So I'm getting about nine kilocalories per gram of fat, mm -hmm. and four and a half for carbohydrate. So, um, but what I've found really works well for me is uh, a very strong breakfast, like um, 13 to 1500 kilocalorie for breakfast. What would that be? What would, what's the um, breakfast? It, it, Brook Farm down in Byron Bay have actually yeah. made me a breakfast. They made a gr granola <laughs> and a porridge that came in at about seven or 800 calories mm -hmm. in 200 grams. Mm -hmm. And I sent it back and said, listen, it tastes great, but it's not high enough in calorie. You need to get the calories up. So then they cooked it again under pressure and infused it with macadamia nut oil. So macadamia oil is one of the highest calorie natural mm -hmm. oils we have. And it came back at 1300 kilocalories, right. which is almost like drinking petrol. <laughs> right. so, so we took that uh, to New Zealand and the first couple of times we ate it, it was like having a laxative. Like it's so rich in oil yeah. that you just turn into an animal and run and go find a hole in the snow. <laughs> Because not, not, not a lot of toilets where you train. No, no. not at all. So you're running out with a shovel and going, shivers, this is bad. I don't want this in a polar environment. Right. You don't want to have to go more than once a day. So then we, uh, I mixed it over two weeks, just slowly increasing the amount. And by the end of the two weeks, you, your bowel is adjusted to absorbing that big hit in the morning. And um, with a combination of protein powder, sausage and uh, pure fat, so butter. Mm -hmm. Over the full day, you're, you're taking uh, sort of a big breakfast and then three small lunches every two hours. Mm -hmm. And then your evening meal is a big calorie hit as well. Uh, but it's about 6,000 kilocalorie a day. Your bowel can't absorb any more than that. Yep. So that's the maximum. Um, I'm burning about 9,000 calories a day, kilocalorie. Right. So over a 90 day journey, I'd expect to lose probably 25 kilos. So it's, it's a brutal campaign. Like you come out looking uh, like you've come out of Belson or one of the concentration camps. Um, but it's measuring, you know, you don't want your body loss to be so rapid that you don't have the strength to pull yep. the sleds. And that, that's the tricky thing with the journey of this length is realizing you're going to lose biomass. You can't, there's no way you can avoid it. Um, but can you hold on long enough to get to the finish. journey done? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's probably the, the big question on this one. So my last journey, I lost 22 kilos, but there were, I made a lot of mistakes on that one. I lost two weeks worth of food and the last three days before pickup, um, I had no food. So a lot of the weight was lost in that last three days because right. your, your metabolic rate is absolutely burning. Yep. And then as soon as you start putting food in, you start getting uh, cold, but you're also burning muscle because you've got no yeah. fat left yeah. Yeah. at that point. Mm. Um, so the nutrition side is is fascinating, but it, it, it is probably one of, you know, if I said uh, your mental approach, the nutrition, and then just your body biomechanics are probably the three things that make or break mm -hmm. these journeys. Uh, the other thing that's really interesting is most polar expeditions fail in the first 72 hours. If they're gonna fail, so it's that first three days, just getting yourself settled, a bit like, you know, in cricket, the batsman just 
playing the first few balls very safe, mm. and then once you're seeing the ball properly yep. and you're settled in, then you start making the distance. So um, the psychology is fascinating. It really is. Oh, <laughs> we could talk about just just this uh, plan and, and journey for the whole day, I guess. Um, but the tr um, so nutrition is ab absolutely vital, uh, but you also need to be very, very fit to even contemplate such idea. Uh, we did a bit of training this morning, uh, as I mentioned earlier. This is the carnage of the of the food afterwards. Um, so. Uh, what is your training uh, regimen is like? It's pretty, um, like I kind of know, the good thing now is I know intimately what I need my body to feel like before I go, mm -hmm. to have the maximum chance of success. So it's been more just getting the lower back and legs and hip flexors ready for that continual uh, strain because your, your back is the coupling between you and the kite. So just... I'm not sure everyone knows, everyone can picture what it looks like to travel with a kite on land because I'm sure most guys know kite surfing. Yeah. Well, how, how do you utilize a kite on land? Yeah, and that's the thing. Training here is really difficult because we'll, we'll drive to Byron Bay and then just put a kite up and kite all the way home. And that, that like broken ocean is very like a frozen Antarctic surface, right. um, that pounding. So, um, but you know, the idea is that the kite's doing all the work. You're just stabilizing and guiding, and you want to try and get your kite flying to a point where you can turn your brain off, and you're just autopilot. doing auto autopilot. Yep. Um, but then when you add sleds to it, it's fine on smooth ice because the sleds start getting momentum, yep. and there's not a lot of load. But when you get onto what we call sastrugi fields, which a sastrugi field in Antarctica is is an area of ice that's had a storm go through it in the winter and it, it creates waves a bit like the top of a pavlova. You get these horrible waves and you're having to negotiate the sleds up right. and down and if the sleds get caught and then you've got full power, you can get a massive load on your back. Yes. Um, so monitoring inflammation and controlling your back pain um, for 90 days is is the other big key component. Mm. Um, so training wise, we've just come back from a two week training camp in the high country in New Zealand. And I've trained all over the world looking for somewhere that simulates Antarctica, Norway, Japan, right up near Baffin Island yep. uh, in Canada. And nothing is better than New Zealand. Like it's just phenomenal because it's, it's a long flat series of of bread loaf type mountains. You're camping at 6,000 feet, so the nighttime temperatures are down to minus 15, which is really getting your body used to that discomfort, um, testing your sleeping systems, testing the tent, and then getting the skis, kites working. The prevailing wind is 90 degrees to the long axis of the mountain range, so we can kite 50, 60, 70 kilometers, and then turn around and come home, which is amazing. So. Uh, it's very rare to find that group, uh, but this training trip, we had four blizzards in 13 days, so uh, there wasn't a lot of time outside the tent, you know, you're just trying to survive. And uh, So mentally, really good prep, but the, the interesting thing was um, not once in that 13 days did I feel like we got anywhere near the uh, exhaustion point. Mm. Um, so the training over the last six months has been perfect. I, I've, you know, I've got nine weeks to go, I need to try and put three or four kilos of bulk on mm -hmm. um, and maintain the cardio fitness. So mm -hmm. that's a tricky for me because I find if I push the cardio, I lose body weight. Yes. So putting weight on and staying cardio fit, it's always been tricky. Um, but I, I feel like having just come out of New Zealand mentally, uh, it was really reassuring. There were a couple of bits of gear that didn't work that we've got to go back and change, but. The kites were phenomenal, the sleds were phenomenal. Um, Ozone has always made my kites and they've done such a good job. Right. Like the, the way they fly is just phenomenal. And mentally I've broken the journey into four legs. So the, the leg from the coast, the Antarctic coast, um, all the way to the pole of inaccessibility, which is, it's basically if you dropped a pin in the middle of Antarctica 
at the point that's furthest from any coast. So the hardest place to get to. No Australian's ever been there. Right. Um, there's a statue of Lenin there that the Russians put there in 1958. <laughs> so I'll go and have a hug with uh, Lenin. Lenin. And that first leg is just getting bedded in, getting comfortable, uh, testing the systems, not breaking anything. Yep. And then um, from it's about 1,100 kilometres and then another 800 and 90, I think, to the South Pole. Mm. So the second leg is from Lenin to the South Pole. Um, and that, once again, is, is just a physicality. It's just an endurance event. The third leg is where this whole journey could either be a success or, or failure because it's um, a 1.3 kilometer vertical climb over 880 kilometers. So if you think about that, that's for every 880 meters you go forward, it's about a meter and a half vertical yep. ascent, which doesn't sound like much, but pulling 150, 160 kilos by then, um, it'll be a significant climb. And all of our weather reporting indicates that there'll be very light wind or no wind. So it could be a lot of hauling. A lot of pulling, and yeah. the hauling, um, in deep snow, you just can't physically pull 160 kilos. So I'll have to split load, which split loading is where I'll, I'll split the sleds, pull one sled uh, up three kilometers, ski back down, pick the second one up, do it again. So to cover three kilometers, you're skiing nine. Right. And to do that right. for 880 kilometers. In temperatures of? Well, Dome A is the coldest naturally occurring place on planet Earth. So um, in January, it could get down to minus 45, minus 55. So the cold, the cold is a concern, hands, feet, face. You know, at that temperature, um, in an hour, you could get frostbite. So right. um, the management, leg three is the real crunch. And then once I get to the top of Dome A, and I'm already uh, visualizing my boot, stepping on the top of Dome yes. A <laughs> over and over and over again. Yeah. So it's, it'll, I'll get there. Once I get to the top of Dome A, then it's just staying safe and trying to keep my body weight up while I make the two and a half thousand kilometer run downhill back to the coast. Um, so now mentally, obviously I'm, I've broken into four legs, but leg three is the one that's requiring more time. You know, just building mentally how it's going to look. And uh, one of the keys there was getting a sled system that could kite upwind. Mm -hmm. So it's very difficult to kite upwind in deep snow with a lot of weight on. If, you, if it's just your skis and a kite, you can tack at 45 degrees and get upwind, no problem. But with heavy weight, it becomes really hard to get upwind. So one of the keys in New Zealand was setting up a kite system uh, on really long lines, because the longer the lines, the better your upwind performance. Mm -hmm. um, and then the sleds set up like a catamaran rather than a mono hull, so they're side by side. And amazingly, with that system fully loaded, I could do 45 degrees to the wind, which means that even if the wind is coming down dome A, potentially I can tack uphill, which would be a lot quicker nice. and less strain on the body than um, man hauling. Wow. So that's what, you know, so, we'll find out. Wow. And, you know, you, you have obviously planned, you've been training for this for many years, you've tested yourself uh, on many occasions, um, but still that, that man, the mental side of it is, is such, such an important, important factor, isn't it? Like in, um, in any training programs, um, whatever you guys choose to do, uh, gym or outdoors, uh, the mental strength side of it is, is, is also, we covered food, we covered physical training, but we mustn't forget about the mental strength. And I know you've, you've given talks to uh, uh, athletic teams in, around here. Yeah. Um, was mental strength part of, part of those talks? Yeah, definitely. I think the, what I'd call the line killer approach yep. is really important. So, um, I, you know, I talk a lot about this shift in mental attitude um, to lines in your life. So mm. whatever your line is, whether that's, you know, obesity, depression, anxiety, cancer, you know, a child taking drugs within your family, mm. um, you know, marital stress, whatever it is, that's a line coming into your life to destroy and kill. Mm. 
and uh, there's a, a warrior who I've always admired and loved uh, called Benaiah, who is a Hebrew warrior who is the only record we have in history of a warrior uh, not being told to go into battle and, and fight, but he's walking home from a battle and he sees a lion in a pit. And it, in the story, it mentions that it's a snowy day. So it's a cold day. He's walking home. He's just killed two giants in a, in a battle with another tribe. So he's obviously physically fatigued, but he sees this lion in there and it's roaring and, and upset because <coughs> it's in the pit. And whether he jumps in um, just because he wants the battle or whether he jumps in to end the lion rather than have it die of starvation, we never know. But the modern approach would be that he's doing the right thing by reducing the animal suffering. But, you know, for the sake of the story, he could easily have walked past but he jumps into the pit with no weapon and fights this lion with his bare hands and kills it. And I think modern day life, we are taught to walk past. The lion is there, just walk quietly, maybe it won't kill you. Um, and it's the wrong approach. You know, what I'm trying to get across with a shift in mental attitude to lions in your life is the last thing the lion in your life expects is for you to go at it, to grab it by the throat and squeeze the life out of it. Right. And for men particularly, um, to, to get through that 40 to 80 period and still be driven and energized, you cannot ignore the lines in your life. You need to deal with them. Mm. And start with the small lines, like the little pussy cat in the <laughs> corner. Jump on that thing, deal with it head to head. Yep. Um, and then slowly your confidence in your line killer approach improves to a point then, you, you know, you've got the mental strength to do a solo for 90 days across Antarctica. That, that mental approach didn't start from me jumping in the pit with big lines. It started with little lines. Mm. Um, but that, mm. that shift in mental approach can be taught. And that, the amazing thing with Simon, my son-in-law who lives downstairs, is that his first journey with me uh, was crossing the Torres Strait. And 70 kilometres from the, the coast, he tapped out. He said, I'm done. I can't do this. And I talked him through the rest of the journey and he made it. But there was a point where mentally he was finished. Four years later in Greenland, he's again partnering with me. And it was a brutal journey, probably five times the physicality of the Torres journey. But at no point did he even think about tapping out. So his mm. lion killer approach has been honed and developed over a four year period. Right. And, you know, for those of people listening to this podcast going, well, I've got lions in my life everywhere and I don't feel the capacity to take one of them on. You know, it's just an encouragement. Pick a small one and run at that thing, squeeze the life out of it and start getting aggressive or pounding the ground. Like the other thing that I see in adventure a lot is people have a bad set of cards given to them mm -hmm. and they give up too early. In Greenland, by the end of day seven, it looked as though we were not going to break any record other than the fastest team to starve to death in Greenland. Uh, we'd covered very little distance. We'd had terrible weather, less than 30 kilometres in a week. And I threw a, a man tantrum. I started pan <laughs> punching the snow and Simon came up to me and said, you know, what's going on? What are you upset about? Have I upset you? I said, no, no, Simon, I'm not. I'm not upset with you, you've been phenomenal, um, but I'm upset with the situation. Mm. You know, we have trained harder than any duo I know has ever trained for Greenland. We've got the best sleds, best skis, best kites, best nutrition, everything, all the prep's been done. We should be conquering this and we should be ahead of the game and on track for mm. a record. I'm demanding a change in our circumstance, <laughs> you know, and panning the ground. Anyway, it would be nice up, if it worked. <laughs> yeah. Well, the next morning we got up and the, the, um, the wind had shifted mm. and we put our boots on and in the next week we covered more distance than any pair have ever covered in the history of polar travel. So over 1,200 kilometres in a calendar week. And that set oh, us really? up mm. to break the record by over two weeks. So there's a point in time where you can demand a change in circumstance. And whether it's cancer, whether it's a failing business, a failing marriage, um, 
as men in your household, you have to stand and the lion killer approach is about standing. It's about the Spartans in the gap saying you shall not pass. It's, you know, man after man in history who has gone, I'm gonna change history here. I'm gonna change circumstance. But it starts with you pounding the ground and going, no, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna see this happen the way that it's naturally happening. I wanna change it. And there's a supernatural shift that happens when you make that mental change and go, no, I'm not gonna stand for this. And Benaiah was the first man to show us how it's done. So, um, you know, he, he's definitely a hero of mine. Uh, my last question to you would have been, what advice would you give to a 40 plus guy who is thinking about changing their circumstances, their um, fitness, their health? You just summed it up. You answered that question with this uh, just absolutely brilliantly. Um, so thank you very much, Jeff. Uh, we appreciate your time. I really enjoyed the training this morning. Um, you guys, if you want to find more about, more about Jeff, um, he's got a website called the Fifth Element Ex uh, Explorations, is it? Uh, am I Expedition. Expeditions. Fifth Element Expeditions. Go, go online, check um, Jeff's website out. It's, it's worth a look. And uh, I will see you again with the next episode of the 45 Project. Bye now.